you for that very generous introduction. Um, and thank you for having me to the conference. It's wonderful to see such a, a large audience. Uh, well, when Eddie first invited me to speak on federalism at this conference in a session shared with Judith Brett, he suggested Sir Darrell Dawson as a topic. And I declined, and not because of lack of admiration for Sir Darrell, who's an old friend, but because I've written about him elsewhere and I have nothing more to add. But while thinking about a topic further, it occurred to me that there was a particular aspect of Australian federalism that was capable of linking both Deakin and Dawson, which also is topical, which might be of interest to you. And that topic is the source of authority of the Commonwealth's power to spend and by extension to contract. The issues that it raises are familiar in other countries as well, but as they've developed here, the story has taken some distinctively Australian twists and is still playing out. As Judith has just described, Australia became a federation as a way of uniting six colonies in a nation for a continent and a continent for a nation, as the catch cry went. From that perspective, Australia was an almost classic coming together federation. Union has long since been achieved, however, through the sorts of efforts that Judith described De uh, Alfred Deakin as making. The contemporary challenge is to realise the potential of federalism for Australian democracy across an area that is geographically vast, with diverse needs and attitudes, in a political culture that's not well attuned to consultation, negotiation and power sharing. The federalism provisions of the Australian Constitution are modelled closely on those of the United States. In fact, however, Australia was quite different to the US in many ways that affected the fit of the US model. One of these was the dependence of the Australian colonies, about to become states, on customs and excise as sources of revenue. The emphasis that the framers of the Australian Constitution placed on internal free trade meant the duties of customs and also, or so they thought, excise, needed to be exclusive Commonwealth powers. How to deal with the impact of that on the budgets of the states occupied more time of the framers of the Constitution than just about any other issue. Despite the, their labours, in the end, with hindsight, the result was unsatisfactory, made even worse by some last-minute changes at the Premier's Conference in 1899. As the Constitution emerged from the Premier's Conference, um, transitional provisions for revenue re redistribution would manage the problem only for the first 10 years. After that, the only continuing guarantee was a requirement for the Commonwealth to redistribute to the states monthly its surplus revenue, a requirement that was quickly circumvented by accounting practice. Thereafter, the only explicit authority for any revenue redistribution was the power for the Commonwealth to make grants to the states under Section 96, a section added to the draft at the Premier's conference, and therefore at the last minute, which apparently was intended to be transitional, but which in practice now is permanent. This is the context in which Alfred Deakin famously remarked in an anonymous letter to the Morning Post in 1902, that Federation left the states legally free but financially bound to the chariot wheels of the central government. The use of this familiar quote almost always assumes Deacon's prescience. Indeed, the letter as a whole seems to speak remarkably accurate to current conditions if read through a contemporary lens. But Deacon could not possibly have foreseen the manner in which the imbalance between legal power and financial muscle would play out in Australia, and with what practical consequences. For a period, in fact, after the financial agreement of 1927, the states were independent of the Commonwealth for general revenue redistribution. But that balance changed dramatically after World War II, initially through the Uniform Income Tax Scheme, and gradually through the expanding judicial interpretation of duties of excise. These two developments left the main sources of revenue in the hands of the Commonwealth, 
the bases for general revenue redistribution, including interstate equalisation, have been a continuing problem ever since. The effect of the fiscal imbalance on Australian Federation is a well-known story that I don't intend to pursue further. Rather, I want to draw attention to one other consequence of the imbalance, the encouragement that it offered the Commonwealth to rely on its very considerable revenues to expand its authority into areas of state responsibility. One obvious vehicle for that purpose is the Commonwealth's power under Section 96 to grant financial assistance to the states. Increasingly, however, the Commonwealth has bypassed the states, relying on direct spending in areas where its legislative powers are at best doubtful. Typically, such programs rely solely on executive action, apart from a usually very general appropriation to outcomes by the parliament. Sometimes these programs are effectively grants, accompanied by uh, often detailed executive guidelines. Sometimes the vehicle for expenditure is contract. This has become an attractive model for successive Commonwealth governments of both political persuasions. Apart from the advantages of avoiding federal limitations on legislative power, it also avoids both houses of the Commonwealth Parliament and presents a more than usually difficult target for judicial review. Initially, the practice was much less prevalent than it is now. Whenever the issue arose, however, in any significant context, there was uncertainty about the source of authority for it. Comparisons sometimes are drawn with Canada and the United States as the two most obviously comparable federations, in both of which a federal spending power was implied from the Constitution. But in both of those federations, the power was implied to enable the central level of government to make grants to the provinces or states in the absence of an equivalent of Australia's Section 96. From that point of view, the inclusion in the Australian Constitution of an express power to spend through the states operated against an implied power to spend in ways that could not be supported by legislation. For a while, nevertheless, it was assumed that Commonwealth spending depended on the meaning of sections in the Constitution requiring parliamentary appropriation for the purposes of the Commonwealth. There was disagreement about what this meant. Were these purposes those that could be determined by the Parliament of the day, or were they circumscribed by constitutional limits? This debate intersected with academic writing, encouraging the view that for the purposes of contract and spending, the executive branch of government was just like an ordinary person. On this view, because contract and spending were consensual, they should not be subject to constitutional, including federal constraints. The source and scope of Commonwealth power to spend were challenged during the heady days of the Whitlam federal government, a government with an ambitious social agenda running across areas of both Commonwealth and state authority, but a poor relationship with many of the states. One initiative was the Australian Assistance Plan, a plan to provide funds to regional councils for social development across the country. The validity of the plan was challenged by Victoria in 1975. Daryl Dawson QC was the Victorian Solicitor General. The AAP case was one of those rare High Court decisions in which the plaintiff lost but made advances in the doctrinal war. The court divided equally 3-3 on the merits. A seventh judge, Sir Ninian Stephen, holding the ring, held that the plaintiff's state lacked standing. This was a finding with which the others disagreed, but it nevertheless prevented Sir Ninian from deciding the merits. I was in the Victorian Law Department the day the decision was handed down. To say that Sir Darrell was displeased is to put it mildly. On close reading of the reasons of the various judges, however, the doctrinal ground had shifted. The clearest, the clearest indication of the change lay in the reasons of Justice Mason, which subsequently became the most influential. Under his uh, reasons, appropriation was a process internal to the Commonwealth level of government, necessary but not the source of a power to spend. The source of authority for spending and contracts was the executive power in Section 61 of the Constitution.
the executive power was limited, not only, obviously, by considerations of separation of powers, but also by the federal character of the Constitution, including the legislative division of power. Even allowing for some flexibility in the federal scope of the executive power, the AAP scheme was beyond the pale. Judicial challenges to government spending are, are unusual. Recipients have standing, but are unlikely to object. The standing of third parties may be uncertain, as the AAP case made clear. There was no early judicial follow-up to the decision in that case to clarify its meaning. In these circumstances, the very odd outcome led to divergent understandings of what the case meant across Australia. My colleagues and I at Melbourne Law School taught students for the next 30 years that the Commonwealth power to spend was limited. The Commonwealth itself, however, interpreted the case as a positive income, uh, outcome and paid far less attention to constitutional constraints. And so matters stood until the end of the first decade of the 21st century, when another three spending cases came before the High Court. The first was a fallout of the global financial crisis in a case called PEEP, and I won't bother you with that, except to say that it laid the foundation for the others. Both the other cases dealt with a challenge to the school chaplains program. This program funded chaplains in schools across Australia through contractual arrangements with participating schools, and some states had similar programs. The Commonwealth program was entirely dependent on executive action. It operated pursuant to executive guidelines, which were detailed and frequently changed. The program was challenged by Mr Williams, a parent of children at one of the schools, and his standing was accepted by the court, or at least assumed. In the first Williams case, a majority of the court held that the contracts were invalid because they were not supported by the Commonwealth's executive power. In other words, the High Court by this time had adopted the view of Justice Mason in the AAP case that the source of the Commonwealth power to spend is the executive power of the Commonwealth. In the first case, the school chaplains program was invalid because it needed the support of legislation. The flaw in the scheme on which the court's decision turned was therefore linked to separation of powers. The analogy between the executive government and ordinary people was repudiated. It wasn't necessary for the court to consider the obvious possibility that there were other flaws in the scheme as well derived from federalism. It followed from this decision that there was no general inherent Commonwealth executive power to contract and to spend. Some contracts can be, can be made without supporting legislation. The scope of these is unclear, but they include at least contracts made in the ordinary course of administration. While the reasoning of the justices varied, all drew on the text and structure of the Australian Constitution, including federalism and parliamentary democracy, in construing the meaning of the Commonwealth's executive power. The dependence of the reasoning of the court on the context of the Australian Constitution makes it hard to predict with certainty whether state executive power is similarly limited, although my best guess is that it will prove to be. As the hearing in Williams 1 progressed, and the possibility of an adverse decision appeared to increase, the Commonwealth took steps to ascertain how many other spending programs might be at risk. The final tally in 2012 was around 400, which may or may not have been complete. In the immediate aftermath of the decision, legislation hastily passed through Parliament provided a statutory basis for all existing programs in an unusual manner that gave them the status of delegated legislative instruments. The legislation also allowed for future spending programs to be put in place through delegated legislation. Political rhetoric at the time claimed that this was a temporary measure, but in fact it is still in place. The school chaplain scheme, now with a form of delegated legislative underpinning, was challenged again by the indefatigable Mr Williams in the case of Williams No. 2, and once again the challenge succeeded. The court stuck to its guns in relation to the scope of inherent executive power. But the real issue now was the, 
was not the need for legislative action as required by the separation of powers, but the validity of the supporting legislation. The regulation that now underpinned the school chaplains program was oddly drafted and its purport was not entirely clear, but at least it provided the court with a legislative text that could be measured against the yardsticks that the constitutional heads of federal legislative power provide. The court found the regulation wanting in the sense that it wasn't supported by any head of legislative power. Both benefits to students and the trading corporation's power were rejected as possibilities. The case illustrates well how an understanding of the executive power that requires legislation for contracts of this kind serves to reinforce the federalism limits in the Constitution, as well as enhancing accountability to the Parliament. Direct action having failed, the decisions in these cases forced the Commonwealth back to Section 96, requiring negotiation with the states if it wanted to continue with the program. I welcomed the Williams decisions, and I wasn't alone, as strengthening federalism and democracy individually and as a compound conception of federal democracy. In a sense, the decisions are timeless, but they're particularly important at this time. Current practice in the delivery of public policy relies extensively on public contracts for a range of purpose with contemporary and intergenerational significance. The performance of public services, very large-scale infrastructure, the sale of public assets. Australia is by no means the only country following these trends or grappling with the consequential issues. It is, however, grappling with them in the distinctive context of Australian constitutional federal democracy fuelled by the fiscal imbalance. Elsewhere, there is burgeoning debate about suitable institutional mechanisms for public spending and public contracts that serve the public interest without undermining the fabric of the constitutional system. The Williams decisions provide the opportunity to have that debate here too. So far, the opportunity has not particularly been taken, although I have to say that I don't despair. It's bound to happen in due course. And I raise these issues with you today to take them to a wider, informed audience. And I'm happy to hear any questions or suggestions you may have in due course. But meanwhile, the story continues. Regulations to underpin executive spending continue to be made. It's impossible to tell whether they're made for all the new post-2012 spending programs that the outcomes in Williams place at risk. The relevant Senate Standing Committee has insisted that the explanatory memorandum that accompanies new spending regulations identify the head of power that supports each of them. The typical government response, my cursory research suggests, is that the spending is generally supported by the nationhood power, almost certainly a slender read if and when another of these programs reaches a court. Political practice seems otherwise to be unaffected by these cases. Those alive to the problem watched aghast during the last election campaign as candidates from both sides of politics promised goodies from football fields to car parks that are almost certainly beyond Commonwealth power unless achieved through grants to the states. And those concerned about fiscal management should be struck by this syndrome as well. No real opportunity for prioritisation, no attempt to fit isolated incidents of Commonwealth largesse uh, into existing developed state programs. So to return to the connections with which I began, Alfred Deacon could not have foreseen these particular developments and I like to think that he also would have been concerned. And I know where Sir Darrell stands. I saw him the other night and grumbled that the Commonwealth was still ignoring the limits on its so-called spending power. And he looked at me and shook his head and said, they always have. Thank you.